I guess we'll get started. Um, does anybody have a link to the live stream? Anybody, anybody, anybody? Does anybody normally watch the live stream in here? Anybody? It's not coming up for me, so if anybody knows somebody who's trying to watch the live stream, ask them if they can actually see the stream, because I can't. Um, they may have to watch the video. Um, hopefully this is recording. Who knows? We'll see what happens. All righty. Uh, today is more point, sorry, is it working? Oh, good. All right, I guess it's my laptop or something. I don't know. Um, right, so today is more pointers and array stuff. Um, so pointers, you can compare them, uh, which is, you might think is a little weird, but you can actually compare two pointers for equality uh, or inequality if you want to. Right, and you would use equals equals or not equals to do so. Um, but when you do so, you have to be uh, a little bit careful about how C, whoops, about how C defines what it means for two pointers to be equal. So C considers two pointers to be equal if they both point to the same object, which makes sense, right? So if you have, uh, if you have two pointers pointing to the same object, it kind of makes sense that the pointers ought to be equal. If they're not pointing to the same object, it also makes sense that the pointers are not equal. Um, now, one of the weird things in C is that uh, you're allowed to have a pointer uh, that, pats, that points to the element that's one past the end of an array. Right, so you have an array, you're allowed to point to the place that's one location after the array. Right, so you have an array of length three, you're allowed to take a pointer to the start of the array and then add uh, zero, one, two, three, and then add three to it, right, to get to the position after the array. So the language guarantees that that pointer um, exists. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can dereference it, it just means that the pointer exists, and I'll show you why um, that is the case in a moment. So if two pointers point one past the end of the same array, then they're also equal. Right? There'll be an example coming up in a moment. Um, and then you can have what's called a null pointer. So a null pointer uh, is a pointer that points to nothing. Right? So two null pointers are considered to be equal in C. All right. Now, um, you can have pointers that point to different objects. Right? So if those two objects have different types, you're still allowed to compare the pointers. Right? You can still check if they're equal or not equal. Um, but the compiler will issue a warning. Right? Uh, the reason it issues a warning is because it doesn't really make sense uh, to compare a pointer to an int to see if it's equal to a pointer to a double. Right? If you're doing something like that, then you're probably doing something wrong. Um, but the language allows it. Right? Um, now, complicating this is that the language also has a void pointer. Right? So the pointer that can point to anything Right? And that means if you have two void pointers, one can be pointing to an int, the other can be pointing to a double, right? but you can still compare those, and now the compiler doesn't um, issue a warning. Because right? the compiler doesn't actually check to see what it's pointing to, it just knows that the type of the pointer is void, which means the pointer can point to anything. Okay, so let's look at an example. Uh, we have uh, an int i, right? and then on the next line, I've got a pointer, uh, that uh, points to i, right? And then on the third line, I have another pointer that also points to i, right? And now I can check, do the two pointers, are, they e are the two pointers equal, right? Are, do they point to the same object, right? And this program should print out p points to the same object as pi. Right, and it does, right? So that's, um, Right, that's the, that's the program that I just showed you. Right, so it does in fact print out uh, that the two pointers are in fact equal. Right. Uh, now, here's the example where you have a, um, an int i. Right, so I've got an int object, I've got a double object. Right, I take a pointer to the int object, and then I take a pointer to the double object. Right, and now I compare them. Right, so in this sense, uh, in this um, example, the comparison doesn't really make sense. Right, because the answer is always going to be false. They point to different objects. Um, so the compiler here will issue a warning if you try to compile this program. Compare point to warning. So when you compile this uh, program, yeah, I'm just going to call it a dot out. Right, you'll get a warning. Right, so it says if there's a warning. You're comparing pointers of distinct types, and you're not using a cast. Right, so um, it, it gives you a warning, but it compiles your program and it still runs. 
right? And then now it says that PI points to a different object than PD, which is good, right? That's what it should print. Okay, now what about this pointer past the end of the array? So that's got a special name. It's called the too far pointer. Right? So C guarantees that a pointer can point to the element one position past the end of an array. Right? In other words, if you have an array, I guess, of length three, Right, so here's my array A. Right, you know that that thing there is just the address of A0. Right? Well, it turns out you're also allowed to make this pointer here, uh, which is the address of A0, uh, zero, 1, 2, 3. Right, so that pointer exists. Right, and it's called the too far pointer because it's too far right past the end of the array. Uh, so the pointer exists, but you're not allowed to dereference it, right? So if you try to run, so if I say p equals this thing, right, and if you write star p, right, anything can happen. So that's undefined behavior in C, right? The, the language doesn't say what happens, anything can happen. So you can't dereference that pointer. Now the reason is why on earth is that? Why on earth is the language guaranteed that that exists? It's a little weirder. The language says that there can be something here. Right? So there can actually be something there um, sitting in memory. Now it's needed because there's a bunch of older C code um, that basically looped over the elements of an array by moving a pointer. Right? So you can imagine if you're looping over this array and you've got a pointer into the array and you just move the pointer one step at a time, uh, eventually you end up here. Right? So um, because this was so frequently used, um, the people who standardized the language decided that they didn't want to break all the old existing code. So now the compilers are, uh, have to make sure that the too far pointer um, is allowed to exist. And here's, why, here's an example of how you would use it. Right, so I've got my array up here, length three. Right, I can take, I can compute the too far pointer. Right, it's just the address of, um, it's just, the, uh, it's just the array, so the address of the first element of the array plus three, right? So there's zero, one, two, three, right? I can then take two pointers, right? They both point to the first element of the array. You could also write int star p equals arr, and you can write int star q equals arr, right? You don't have to write the and um, with the zero index. And then you can write a loop that looks something like this. Right, so while p is not equal to the too far pointer, right, then inside your loop do something with p and q. Right, you might want to dereference uh, dereference the pointers to do something with the array elements. Right, and then as you step through the array, you just increment the pointers. Right, so p plus plus means move the pointer to the next element in the array. Right, and if you run this loop, right, obviously this thing doesn't stop until p is equal to the too far pointer. Right. So, uh, well, hopefully it doesn't stop, right, until it gets to the too far pointer, right? And hopefully it does stop when it does get to the too far pointer, right? Um, and so when you run this program um, down here, it checks, does p equal q? Um, and it should, because I'm stepping both pointers in the loop at the same time. That was compare to, right? Right? It, does say, it does say P and Q are in fact equal. Right? So there's actually two pointer comparisons going on here. There's one up here, right, where you're comparing P or Q to the too far pointer. And then there's a second one down here that checks are P and Q pointing to the same, well, are they pointing to the same thing, um, which in this case may or may not be something. Okay, so that's why the uh, too far pointer has to exist. Right? It's because there's a lot of code kicking around that actually does this. Yep. Um, if you have two arrays, how yep. do you reference the too far pointer of each of them? How do you reference the too far point? Oh, do you mean you want to compare the too far pointers for both of them? Yeah. You're not allowed. So that's a good question, though. Um, if they both point one past the end of the same array, then they're equal. Um, but if you're trying to, so I think what you're asking is you have two arrays, and you're stepping, you want to know that's p. Right, and that's Q. You want to write something like is P equal equal to Q? Is that what you want to? 
try um, to do? More so, how am I supposed because when you did too far, yep. the variable would just name too far, yep. right? So that would be the, let's say that's the too far variable for t. Yep. How would I get the too far variable for q? You have to compute that as well. Sorry? You have to compute that as well. Uh, right here? Right, so the first one, so this is the array um, a1. That's the array a2, right? Then too far for 1 uh, is equal to a1, blah, 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 the address of that, plus however long the array is. I don't know how long it is, right? And then too far for 2 is the address of a2, 0, plus however long that one is. Yeah. Um, would, would you be able to do um, the address of A2 if um, the array is only three elements long? Yeah. So you can write, um, yes, you can do that. Because it, it's guaranteed to exist, right? That you're, allowed to take the you're allowed to take the pointer to that thing there. OK. Um, so null pointers. So a null pointer is a pointer that points to no object. Right, so the that's the um, so if you create a pointer but don't assign a value to it, um, if you create a sorry if you create an if you create a local variable that's a pointer, and don't assign a value to it, the value that it gets assigned is the value null, right? All capitals, right? Uh, so the null pointer is the pointer that points to no object. If you try to dereference that pointer, uh, you get undefined behavior, right? That's what's happening in Java when you get the null pointer exception. Right, so when you use a reference that's null, the reference probably is just a pointer. Right, so if you have a reference to no object, that's the same thing as dereferencing a null pointer. Right, and that's why the exception happens in Java. Right, in C, you may get an exception, you may get something else. Right, the program may keep on running, anything can happen. To create the null pointer, you can use the word null, all caps, right, or you're allowed to use integer zero. Right, so there, oh wait, sorry. Uh, but, but, but I actually changed this one, but I guess I didn't change the slide. Okay, so the actual program looks like that, right? So my first pointer P, right, is assigned the value null. The second pointer Q is assigned the value zero, right? In this case, they're both null pointers. So if you compare them for equality, right, they will be equal. Compare null pointer. Oops. All right, so when you run that program, it does in fact print. P and Q are in fact equal, right? So two null pointers are equal to one another. Uh, now, uh, a lot of uh, functions in uh, C return a pointer, right? And the way that most of these functions work is if the function fails for some reason, the pointer that's returned is null. Uh, so what you really have to get used to doing in C, which you never have, to, what you normally don't have to do in Java, right, is you have to test is the returned pointer null or not before you use it, right? So failure to test for null ends up in undefined behavior. Uh, C lets you compare for null in three different ways, right? So if you have a pointer p. You can do not p, right? So not p. If not p is true, uh, then that means the pointer is null. You can directly compare to null, right? And you can directly compare to zero. But what you should not do is you should not make a variable whose value is zero and compare to that, right? So for example, there's p, right? It's null, right? So I'm doing the first test, right? So if not p. Hopefully it prints that out, right? Then I have another if statement. If p is null, hopefully it prints that out, right? If p is equal to zero, well, hopefully it prints that out, right? But the bottom is what you should not do, right? So you should not make a variable or a constant uh, that represents null and then compare to that variable, because what uh, what C is at will actually do in that case it will compare p and the variable as though the variable was a pointer. Right, uh, not the value null. Right. So if you run this program, what's this program called? 
uh, test for null. Right? You let p is a null pointer, p is a null pointer, p is a null pointer, and the fourth test on my computer, right, that fourth one there happens to work. Right? But when you compile the program, oh, where'd it go? Uh, test for null. Right, the compiler will warn you. Right, so you're actually comparing a pointer and an integer. Right, you're not actually testing for null. Right, so it will warn you here that you're doing something that you shouldn't be doing. Right, and so you should put in the test for null. Right, now you might wonder why. Why is it complaining that you're comparing to an integer here, but it doesn't complain up here? Right, so up here. And that's because the language says that p equals equals zero has a special meaning when p is a pointer. Right? Um, but p equals equals some variable does not have a special meaning, even if the variable represents null. Right? So those are the three ways that you can um, check for null. OK, now uh, the problem with all this is that void pointers exist. Right? So a void star, well, a void pointer, right, is a pointer that can point to anything. Right? So that means right, I have i in. I have i and d, right? So i is an int, d is a double, right? So for a p, I can take a pointer to the double value. So it's a void star pointer, so I can make it point to whatever I want, right? So I can make it point to the double value 0, 0.0, right? I can take another pointer that's also void, right? And I can make that point to i. And I can take a third pointer called pd and make that point to d, right? And now I can compare all these pointers, and the compiler doesn't warn you, right? So PI and PD, they're pointing to different objects of different types. Right? So earlier, in the previous example, the compiler would warn you you're trying to compare pointers to different types. Right? Now the compiler doesn't warn you because you've told the compiler that these pointers can point to anything. Right? So the compiler doesn't warn you that you're trying to do something silly here. Um, it simply does the comparison and gives you back the value. Right? So this should not print out PI points to the same object as PD, but it should print out p points to the same object as pd. Right. So compare void pointer. So first I'll compile it uh, to show you that it, doesn't, it does, in fact, not warn you. Whoops, sorry. Compare void. Right. So no warning when you compile. Um, and it runs the way you would expect it to. Right. So p points to the same object as pd. Right? And PI does not point to the same object as PD. OK? You can compare pointers in more ways. Right? So you can use less than, greater than, or equal to, greater than, and greater, sorry, less than, less than, or equal to, greater than, greater than, or equal to. Right? So you can compare them by their location. Um, but when you do this, uh, you have to make sure that your pointers are pointing into the same array, or at least into the same object. Right, so there's, a, there's something I haven't told you about yet. Um, you can have what are called compound objects, which are made up of other objects. Um, so uh, for the time being, right, just remember that if you try to do this, your pointer should be pointing into the same array. Right? So what this lets you do is it lets you do stuff like uh, the following. Right, so you can have a, an array like this. Right, it's got a bunch of elements in it. You can have two pointers. Right, so there's P and there's Q. Right, and there's often there's the case you want to know what is the relative position of these two pointers in the array. Right, so in other words, is Q pointing to something that's further than the array than P? Right, um, or is something or are they pointing to the same object or something else? Right, that's when you use less than or greater than or equal to. So if two pointers point to different elements of the same array, right, the one pointing at the element with the larger index compares greater. So in this case, Q is greater than P. Right, is true, right? Because Q points to an element that comes after P. Now, there's this too far pointer that you have to deal with as well. So if one pointer points to the element of the array, sorry, one pointer points to an element of the array, and the other pointer points to the too far pointer, then the too far pointer compares as greater. 
right? So if you do this one, right, so that's too far, right? Then too far is greater than p and q, right? So too far is greater than p, and too far is greater than q, right? So those are both true. Right, so here's an example where I've got three pointers. Right, P points to the first element of the array, Q points to the second element, and R points to the too far pointer. Right, so I can ask, is R greater than Q? Right, so that's, is too far greater than Q? So that should print out R is greater than Q. Right, and then I can test if Q is greater than P. Right, um, and in this case, Q is in fact greater than P. Right, so this should print out Q is greater than P as, um, also. Compare three. All right, so R is greater than Q and Q is greater than P. All right. Um, so the arrays that we've been looking at so far, they all have um, fixed size where the size is defined by some constant, right? So either you write something like int n square brackets three, or you write int star n equals and then braces some number of values, right? So C99 formally introduced what are called variable length arrays. They existed before C99, so the compiler implementers um, put them into the language, uh, but they weren't formally part of the language until C99. Now, variable length doesn't mean what you want it to mean, unfortunately. Right? So variable length does not mean that you can change the size of the array during the lifetime of the array. Right? So just like Java, once you make an array, the size of the array is fixed for its lifetime. Right? So the size of an array is constant during the lifetime of that array. Variable length means that the length of the array is defined by some variable instead of some constant. So for example, I've got the, this is part of a program. So this, this, uh, this example goes over two slides. So I have this method call, uh, function called print. Right? Um, it takes in a value n. I'll explain what size t is in a second. And it takes in an array right, of length n. Right? So that's the variable length array that's sitting right there. Right? That value n right, is not a constant. Right? It's the value of the argument that's passed into the, uh, to the function. Right? So all this um, function does is it prints out the contents of the array. So if n is 0, right, then you've told it to print out a 0 length array. So uh, in this case, I decided to print out the string of, with the empty square brackets. Right? So this prints out uh, like an empty list in Java. Otherwise, I'm going to print out the contents of the array, so the elements, uh, the elements of this int array, uh, one at a time inside square brackets separated by comma and space. Right? So here I know that the array, uh, or here I've been told that the array is not empty. So I know that the first element of the array exists. Right? So I can print the square bracket followed by the first element of the array. Right? And then I print out the rest of the elements of the array. Right? Now, the reason I'm doing this is because the number of elements in the array is one bigger than the number of separators. Right? So if you print out the first element on its own, then you can use a loop to print out everything else. Right? So the number of commas and spaces is one less than the number of elements in the array. Right? So now I can print out comma space, and then the next element of the array, right? where the next element of the array starts at index 1. Right? And then when the loop is over, I can print out the closing square bracket. OK, so what is this? Uh, well, I'll come back to size t in a moment, because uh, there's actually a slide that explains it. So there's my function print. Now here's my function main. Right? So in the function main, I'm going to ask the run, whoever runs the program to enter in the size for some array. And I'm asking for something less than 20. It doesn't have to be less than 20. I just put in less than 20 here so that we didn't print out these huge arrays. Right. Uh, boop, boop, boop. Okay. So I make a variable called n, set its value to zero, right? And then on the next line, I call this function called scanf, uh, which I'll also explain in a minute. But what scanf does is it reads standard input and then stores uh, the number that the user enters into the variable n, right? And notice I have to pass in the address of n, right? So we'll come to that in a second as well. Okay, so scanf returns the number of elements that were converted uh, that were converted when you called scanf. 
right? So in this call to scanf, I'm asking to convert, right, one element. So the result had better be one. If it's not one, then something went wrong, right? So for example, someone typed in um, like some letters instead of a number, right? So as long as the result is one and n is less than 20, right, because I asked for an array of less than size 20, right, then I make a variable length array, right? So I just make an array, its size is n, right? And then I loop over the elements of the array, setting each element of the array to i, right? So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to whatever. And then I print the array, right? So that's all this is doing. Uh, what's this one called? The VLA1. All right, so if we run the program, it prints out, enter in the size of an array. Okay, so we'll do 10, right? And then it spits out the array, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, right? Which is uh, exactly what we asked it to do. Uh, but uh, you put in a number bigger than 20, right? Nothing happens, which is also what we told it to do. Uh, you give it a, oh, did I screw this up? Hey, I, I think my validation's wrong. Oh no, it works too. Uh, why did that work? Do, 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 do. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that would work. Let's try that again. Mm. So what if I put in minus 100? Does it make the array? Uh, apparently it works. All right, I didn't know that. Apparently you can pass in a, num a negative number there and it doesn't barf. Um, I don't know what the language spec actually says if you do that. Anyway, that seemed to work. Okay, so some notes on this slide. So first of all, I guess we're gonna start with size t. Okay, so size t is, uh, it's an unsigned integer type. Um, it depends on your architecture what the actual type of size t is. Um, I think on my computer it's unsigned long int, right? But it could be something else. So it's the unsigned integer type of the result of the size of operator, right? So whatever size of says it returns, that's what it, um, so size of says it returns the type size t, okay? It's just some unsigned integer number. Um, and size t can store the maximum size of a, uh, the maximum size of a theoretically possible object of any type, right? So in other words, it basically storing an object uh, whose size um, but, but if it's an array, right, you have to be able to index into the array. So it's whatever the largest inter, uh, integer type that you can use as an index is. Right? Uh, it's just the type that you use to define sizes in C, that's all. Okay? It's, it's actually not a separate type. Um, it's something, it, it's, uh, if you look at the definition for it, it's actually something like unsigned long int. It could be long int, uh, it could be unsigned int, depending on, on your computer depending on your operating system and architecture. So that's what size t is. Uh, scanf is like printf, right? Printf outputs something uh, to standard output. Scanf reads something in from standard input, right? When it reads it in from standard input, it tries to convert it according to that conversion string, right? So there is my conversion string in this example, right? So it's percent %lu, so I'm trying to read in a unsigned long number So it reads in standard input and tries to convert the data that's uh, on standard input into the format specified. Uh, so I'm trying to read in an unsigned long. So if I type in ABC, this should barf, right? So it does nothing, right? Which is good. Uh, it doesn't barf. Um, it, uh, back here, right? The result for, the, for scanf comes back as zero because it tried to convert some letters into an unsigned long, and that doesn't work. Uh, so scanf returns zero because it couldn't convert anything. Um, and so it, this goes past my if statement and goes to the return statement. Right, so if successful, it stores the data in the arguments that follows the formatting string. So if I type in an, uh, an, integer, an unsigned integer number, oh, that's why it didn't work, because I didn't type in an unsigned integer number. Right, so when I put in a negative number, it also jumped down to here. Um, it will store the result into the variable called n, right? Now remember, I guess a few weeks ago now, a couple weeks ago anyway, right? When we tried to swap two values, right? You couldn't, uh, you can't swap two, uh, for example, I tried, if I write a function to swap two ints, the parameters can't be both of type int, right? Because uh, there's no way to change the actual, uh, ver the actual variables that are being swapped, right? And so our solution was to pass in a pointer to the variables that you wanted swapped. Well, it's the same thing here, right? If I wanna change the value of n inside the main method 
from within another method. Right? I can't pass in n, because the other method's not going to get the variable n. It's going to get the value that's stored in the variable n. Right? So if I want to change n, I have to pass in the address of n. Right? And so that means scanf takes a pointer um, for all of its uh, following arguments. Right? So that's why you have to take the address of n in this case. OK, scanf can also return this thing called EOF. Um, so EOF uh, indicates that something has gone wrong when uh, scanf tried to process the input. Right? It could be that your standard input has been disconnected for some reason. That would be very weird, but it could happen. Right? Uh, normally what happens is you're using a function called fscanf and you're reading a file, right? and something's gone wrong with the file. Right? Either the file's not readable, or the file has been deleted while you're reading it, or something like that. Uh, or you reach the end of the file. So that's normally when you get EOF. Uh, scanf is defined in standard I.O. OK. OK, um, you'll see more of scanf, and uh, you'll see more of scanf um, as the course goes along. All right, so a variable length array, it's not any different than a regular array. Right? The only difference is, is its size is uh, not a constant. Right? So its size can be specified uh, using a variable. Um, Otherwise, they're both the same. And that means that their lifetime, right? So that means uh, they have automatic storage, right? So that was from a few lectures ago, right? So there's automatic storage, static storage. The other type of storage we're going to talk about in a minute, right? So remember what automatic storage means, right? If you have a variable whose, or you have an object who's, uh, who has automatic storage, that means its lifetime is the block in which it's defined in. Right? So if I make a function, right, and I make an array inside that function, so a regular array or a variable length array, right, then the lifetime of that array is the lifetime of that function. Right? So in other words, it's the function runs. Right? The array gets created as the function runs. When the function stops running, the array goes away. Right? Uh, that means if you want to return an array from a function, you can't use a variable length array or a regular array. Because that array no longer exists after the function returns. Right? So here's make array. Right? Here's print, the exact same as before. Right? Here's my main method, which is exactly the same as before, except instead of making a variable length array in the main method, I'm going to call make array to return an array. Right? So here's make array. It returns an int star. Right? So in other words, it returns a pointer to an int. Right? So that's what that means in front. Um, there's no way to return an array type uh, from, a, from a function. Right? So you can't put an array type uh, in the front here as the return type. You can return a pointer, though. Right? So you can return a pointer to the first element of the array. So inside the function, I make a variable length array of size n. Right? And then I do exactly the same as before. I just fill in the values of the array with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, up to n minus 1. And then I return. Um, then I return the, uh, a pointer uh, to the first element of the array. Right? Notice the comment. Right? What happens when you run this? So this is array lifetime. Uh, so first of all, let's see what happens when you compile it. Uh, lifetime. OK, so when I compile it, you actually get a warning. Right? So inside the function make array, you're returning the address of a local variable. Right, it's trying to warn you that the thing that you're returning has automatic, uh, the array that you're returning has automatic storage. Right? It's not going to exist after the function returns. So what happens when you run uh, the program? Right, you, oh, okay, uh, 10. Uh, you get a segmentation fault. Right? So in other words, you get a runtime error of some kind, um, which, is not to, which is not unexpected. Right? Because after I return that array, down here, and then I try to print the array using another function. Right? The array I'm trying to print no longer exists. Right? Uh, so it's not surprising uh, that the program crashes. It doesn't have to crash. Something else could happen. Um, so if you're lucky, you get a segmentation fault or some, something else. If you're unlucky, the program keeps on running. All right. Now, this seems inconvenient, right? because there's a lot of situations where you're going to want an array or something else. Right? that's returned from a function, and you want the lifetime of that thing to uh, be longer than the lifetime of the function. 
Right? So for example, I mean, data structures are the obvious thing because you're all, uh, are the obvious thing to talk about because you're all, you all, you're all aware of them. Right? So things like stacks, queues, lists, sets, and maps. Right? There are normal implementations are that these things can grow and shrink as you add elements or take them away. Right? So if you add something to a list, you expect the list to grow in size to accommodate the new element. Right? Now, uh, if you're going to implement something like this, and you're really going to want to implement something like this, right? um, then your data structure that you're implementing, um, wherever you're storing the data for these elements, they can't have automatic storage. Right? So why not? Because when you add the thing to the function to the list, right, inside your method, if that storage is automatic, it goes away after the function returns. Right? So that's no good. Um, now you might think, well, I can get around this problem by making them static. Right? So I can create a static uh, storage for these things. Now remember, static storage is the li lives for the lifetime of the program, but you shouldn't do that either. Right? The reason you shouldn't do that is because you don't know how big this list is going to get. Right? Um, you can actually do this. So you could make a static array uh, of very, very, very large size. Right? And then hope that you never add more elements uh, into the array uh, than you've allocated space for. Right? But you shouldn't do that because you're wasting a lot of memory. Right? So what you really want is something where you can dynamically allocate memory and not have, the thing, and not have that memory disappear. Right? So C lets you do that. Right? So dynamically allocated memory has what's called allocated storage duration. Right? So not static storage duration, not automatic storage duration, but allocated storage duration. So the lifetime of an allocated object, right? that, so that begins after the function that does the memory allocation returns. Um, and it ends uh, when someone deallocates the memory. Right? So when you call the deallocation function for that thing. Right, so now the lifetime of the object is under control of the programmer, which is what you want if you're trying to make something like a list or a, some sort of collection. OK, so where does this dynamically allocated memory come from? So dynamically allocated memory is managed by something called a memory manager. Uh, and that's not part of the C language specification. Right? So the C language specification makes no mention of a memory manager. Right? So instead, the memory manager is normally provided by the operating system. Right. Um, there's many, many different implementations of memory managers. Right. Uh, the memory manager that you get uh, depends on your operating system and the computer architecture that you're, your system architecture that you're running on. Right. Some programs, so some C programs, will even implement their own memory manager to use. Right. Because the ones that are provided by default uh, may not be sufficient for their purposes. Right. Normally, that happens if you're re allocating really huge chunks of memory. Um, so that's the situation where you're gonna, uh, you may need to write your own memory manager. Do, do, do. So the memory manager is the thing that's responsible for allocating memory. Right? So if you need memory for a dynamically allocated uh, object, you ask the memory manager. Or something asks the memory manager for that memory. Right? Now, when you're done with that memory, you have to let the memory manager know that you're done with that memory so that the manager can give that memory to somebody else. Right? So it's, man it's also responsible for managing any uh, deallocated memory. Right? So any memory that's returned back to the memory manager. OK, so there's something called the heap. So if you actually, if you read um, like Stack Overflow or anything, any of the online resources, you'll come across terms like stack and heap. Right? The heap is where, is, is not necessarily where dynamically allocated objects come from. But it's usually, uh, in many implementations, it's where uh, dynamically allocated memory comes from. Right? So there's something called the heap. The heap is nothing more than just big blocks of memory. Okay? And there's something called the memory manager that manages those blocks of memory. The allocator that's in the memory manager is the thing that services requests for memory. Right? So you ask the memory manager, I need a block of memory of x bytes. Right? The allocator in the memory manager looks in the big chunk of memory, looks in the heap for a chunk of memory that's x bytes big. Right? It marks those, uh, that chunk of memory as being used right? and hands that back uh, to the memory manager. The memory manager then returns a pointer to that memory block so that the caller has access to that memory. Right? Now, 
the system has just given you a bunch of memory, right? So as a programmer, you can ask for some memory. It's given you a, a pointer to that memory, right? It's now your responsibility to return that memory back to the memory manager when you're done with it, right? Uh, so it's the requester's responsibility to deallocate or free uh, the memory when it's no longer needed. OK, so when do you use uh, allocated memory as opposed to a variable length array or a regular array or uh, automatic storage? Right? Um, you're going to use it when you don't know what the exact memory requirements are before you run your program, right? which is almost any non-trivial program nowadays. Right? If your program uses a list or a stack or a map or something like that, you're going to need dynamically allocated memory, because right? you don't know how big that thing's going to get. The, now, dynamically allocated memory is less efficient than statically allocated memory. Right? So statically allocated memory, that's allocated by the compiler right? uh, when it compiles the program. Um, so your program has a chunk of memory in it that's reserved for uh, the stat stat statically allocated objects. Right? If you're asking for dynamic memory, the memory manager has got to go out, find some memory for you, return it back to you, and so on and so forth. Right? So there's some overhead. Uh, to asking for dynamically allocated memory. The other problem with dynamically allocated memory uh, is that it's the caller, it's the requester's responsibility to return the memory back when they're done. Right? And it's easy to forget to return the memory back to the memory manager when you're done. Right? So that's what's called a memory leak. Right? So a memory leak occurs when the requester neglects to return unused memory back to the memory manager. Right? So all of this stuff about dynamically allocated memory um, and having to uh, manually return memory back to the manager, uh, Java got rid of that. Right? So you, when you did your Java course, you never had to deal with memory directly. Right? All you had to do was say new blah, and you got a new object. Right? So the object in Java, when you write new, is allocated on the heap, probably allocated on the heap. Right? But you never have to free that object. Right? The garbage collector in Java takes care of getting rid of, the, uh, of releasing the memory with that object when you're done with it. That's not the case in C or C++. Right? So in those languages, now it's the programmer's responsibility to return that memory back. Right? Uh, it was not uncommon in the 90s, 80s, 90s. Right? You would run a program for a long time, and all of a sudden it would crash. Right? Uh, it, couldn't, it would, might not be doing anything. It would just suddenly crash. And the reason it normally crashes is because it ran out of memory. Right? Because it was doing something, and it was asking for dynamically allocated memory, right? and then not returning it back. Eventually, the memory manager runs out of memory. The program dies. Right? Uh, yeah, we can keep on going. OK, so if you need dynamically allocated memory, you have to import standard lib.h. Right? So standard lib.h has a bunch of functions in it. Some of them are related to dynamically allocated memory. Uh, there's three you need to worry about in this course. Um, there is a fourth one if you're programming in C11, but we're not doing that. Uh, so the ones we're interested in are malloc, calloc, and realloc. Right? Memory allocation, clear and allocate, uh, and reallocate. Okay? There's one function for releasing allocated memory that's called free. OK, so malloc. Malloc attempts, well, it asks the memory manager for an uninitialized block of memory of a specified size. Right? Now, it, uninitialized is important here. Right? So the memory that malloc returns can have anything in it. Right? So uh, you have no idea what's in the memory. Right? You're getting back a chunk of memory. It's totally uninitialized. You have to specify the size of the block of memory that you would like. And now remember, when you uh, sizes in C, they're measured in terms of the size of car, right? So you're asking for memories in multiples of cars. If malloc returns a pointer, then you have a pointer to that allocated memory. If it returns null, then malloc has failed, uh, or something has failed when you call malloc, and you don't have a pointer to that memory, right? So you need to, you really should check the return value of malloc um, to make sure that it's not null. Of course, I'm not going to do that on the next slide, but all right. Anyway, here's make array, right? So now, instead of um, making a variable length array here, I'm going to call malloc, right? So there's malloc, and then the only argument to malloc is how much memory would you like, right? 
So make array is making an array of, of int, right? And it's making an array of n ints, right? So I need to ask malloc for n times the size of int um, amount of memory, right? Uh, so I can't just ask for n blocks of memory because that's going to give me back enough memory for n cars, right? If I want n ints, then I have to multiply by the size of int, right? If you want n doubles, you multiply by the size of double, right? After this, you really should check for null, but I didn't, um, partly because I know the array size is less than 20, right? If I can't allocate enough memory for 20 ints, I've got bigger problems, right? So then you just return the pointer, right? And now down here, I just call make array with n, right? I print the array, and then I play nice and free the array when I'm done with it, right? If I don't free the array here, right, the memory's not returned back to the memory manager. Now, it doesn't really matter in this case because the ne very next thing I do is end the program. So when you end the program, all the, all the memory that you've used is released back anyway. Right? But you should, always free the, um, you should always free the memory that's sitting in that pointer um, after you're done. Right? So if you run this program, so this is array malloc, this one works just fine. Right? And there's no, um, there's no there's no, um, there's, no, uh, there's no compiler warnings when you run this program. Right? So enter an array, five less than 20, so I'm going to do 10. Right? And it spits back an array. If you count them, there are, in fact, 10 elements. Right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Notice that they're all 0. Right? They're all 0 here. And so I don't, uh, there's no loop sitting here where I try to fill in the values. Right? I'm just returning back the, um, the block of memory that malloc gave me. Right? Uh, but, 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 so they're all zero here, but right, the specification for the language says that it's uninitialized memory. Right? So you cannot rely on the fact that your implementation of malloc uh, gives you back, sorry, uh, gives you back zeros. Right? It happens to work on my computer uh, right now. Um, it may not work later. Right? And it may not work when you move it to some other computer. Right? So malloc, if you need initialized memory, don't use malloc. Uh, so this is a little awkward here, right? You have to do n times the size of the thing that you want, right? The size of the element type. Um, if you're f when you're doing this, it's often easier to write it this way, right? So you can write size of and then the array type that you want and then the number of elements that you want in that array, right? So that's a little bit easier than writing n times size of something. Not a lot easier, but it's a little bit easier, right? So that's going to do the exact same thing. Uh, do I want to go? D -d 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 yeah, this is a, okay. There's only two two more slides. Okay, so if you want initialized memory, then you should use C alloc, right? Now, if you want initialized memory where everything's zero, you should use C alloc. Okay, so that's what C alloc does. Uh, so C alloc will initialize memory for n objects, each having a specified size. So the way you call C alloc is a little bit different, right? So to call C alloc now. Right? You can say I want n things, right? comma, the size of each thing that you want. Right? So it's a little bit different than using malloc. When you call C alloc and you return an array of int, some sort of integer type, it will be all zeros. Right? That also works if you want to do it this way. Right? I can ask for one array of size n. Right? That also works. And when you run this one, uh, you're going to get the exact same result. Right, so five, it's going to be all zeros. Now, unlike malloc, it's guaranteed to be zeros in this case. Right, so if you need zero initialized memory, use C alloc, and that's it. So we'll do realloc and we'll implement a list next class. <laughs>